Hi, I'm Jameson Lopp, and I'm going to give you a crash course on some of the fundamental building blocks used to create cryptocurrencies. Let's begin at the beginning. What is Bitcoin? It's a system that automates the continual discovery of consensus amongst its participants. It's machine consensus that ultimately enforces human consensus. Bitcoin is designed to be peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash that is more valuable than legacy systems because of the monetary autonomy it brings to its users via decentralization. Bitcoin seeks to address the root problem with conventional currency, which is all the trust that's required to make it work. Not that justified trust is a bad thing, but trust makes systems brittle, opaque, and costly to operate. Trust failures result in systemic collapses, trust curation creates inequality and monopolies, and naturally arising trust choke points can be abused to deny people access to systems. Through the use of cryptographic proofs and decentralized networks, Bitcoin minimizes and replaces these trust costs. But how does Bitcoin minimize trust? It does it with the properties afforded to us by cryptography. With the available technology, there are fundamental trade-offs between scale and decentralization. If the system is too costly, then people will be forced to trust third parties rather than independently enforcing the system's rules. If the Bitcoin blockchain's resource usage relative to the available technology is too great, then Bitcoin loses its competitive advantages compared to legacy systems because validation will be too costly, thus forcing trust back into the legacy system. As such, efficient use of resources is important so that as many people as possible can afford to verify the state of the system independently. So what are some of the building blocks we use in Bitcoin? One of them is chains of cryptographic hashes. A hash function is a function that deterministically maps an arbitrarily large input space into a fixed output space. That's a pretty complicated description. So instead, I like to imagine a hash function as a fingerprinting machine. It takes an input, which is generally a bunch of characters, and returns a corresponding cryptographic fingerprint for that input, which is another string of characters. The first requirement of a cryptographic hash function is that it should be one way. That means that, given a hash, it should be computationally impossible to invert the hash function and compute its input. The second requirement is that a cryptographic hash function should have an avalanche effect. This means that if a single bit changes in the input, it should trigger an avalanche that jumbles the output bits. That is, two very similar inputs that differ by only one bit of information should have no discernible relationship between their output hashes. The last function that a cryptographic hash function needs is collision resistance. Hashes are used throughout the Bitcoin protocol. Every transaction has a unique hash that covers all of its details. When a transaction spins funds, it does so by referring to the hashes of previous transactions, thus creating a chain of, of hashes for spent outputs that covers every Satoshi that has ever existed. Also, every block has a hash that covers all of its details, including all of the transactions inside it. And quite importantly, the blockchain is a chain of blocks due to each block containing the hash of the previous block, thus making the previous block incorporated into the current block's hash. These chains of hashes give us an important attribute known as tamper evidence. By checking the integrity of a chain of hashes, we can be sure that no one has tampered with any of the historical data, as doing so would break the links in the hash chain. From the fundamental building block of hashes, we can then build something called a Merkle tree. Merkle trees are a kind of cryptographic accumulator, and accumulators allow you to compact many pieces of data into a constant amount of space. Merkle trees are also known as hash trees because they hash data upwards into a tree shape. How do you build a Merkle tree? Well, first you get all of your pieces of data that you want to represent. Then you hash each piece of data separately and line up all of the hashes in the order that you want. Then you gather those hashes into pairs. For each pair, you concatenate the two hashes and take the hash of that in order to create the parent hash. As such, the parent of this hash tree commits to both of its child hashes. 
You then line up all of the parent hashes you've created and repeat that process. And you continue repeating this process until only one parent hash remains. This is the root hash, and it's at the top of the Merkle tree, which commits to all of the hashes below it. Think about it. If there were some other way to produce this exact same root hash, then that would imply the existence of a hash collision, which should be impossible for a strong cryptographic hash function. Thus, the root of this hash tree, known as the Merkle root, must be a unique identifier for this exact tree. So how are Merkle trees used in Bitcoin? One of the operations that you can perform with a cryptographic accumulator is an inclusion proof. This is a small proof that decisively attests that an item exists in the accumulator. They are used extensively in Bitcoin Lite clients, also known as SPV, or Simple Payment Verification Nodes. In Bitcoin, all of the transactions that took place in the last block are bundled together and transmitted to everyone in the network. These blocks can become quite large since they can potentially have thousands of transactions. To save on bandwidth, Bitcoin has a clever trick. Instead of transmitting all of the transactions, you can instead transmit the 80-byte block header that includes a Merkle root of all of that block's transactions. A full node can then prove to a light client that a specific transaction was included in a block by providing the minimum number of nodes in the Merkle tree that follow the path down from the Merkle root to the leaf node for that specific transaction. The light client verifies that this chain of hashes is valid thus proving that the transaction data does exist in that block. Soon, we'll also be using Merkle trees in redeem scripts with something called MAST, which stands for Merkleized Abstract Syntax Trees. So instead of just having a huge blob of a redeem script that has to be put onto the blockchain in order to describe all of the spending conditions for a given address, we can break it up into logical branches and then only reveal the minimum number of nodes in that Merkle tree to prove that the spending conditions being used are actually valid and are included in the overall set of possible spending conditions. This is great for both privacy and scalability because we're able to withhold more information from the global network. Another common primitive used in Bitcoin is public key cryptography. And a crude but useful analogy is to think of your public key like a username. You can share it with anyone, and people can use it to identify you. Your private key, then, is kind of like your password. If it's leaked, it lets anyone impersonate you. In Bitcoin, your key pair is your identity. There is no other form of identity but beyond these cryptographic keys. And at the same time, this also means that generating an identity is as easy as generating a new key pair. When you want to receive Bitcoin, you display an address that is created from your public key. When you want to spend that Bitcoin later, you use the corresponding private key to generate a cryptographic signature that proves that you are the owner of the public key to which the Bitcoin was sent. You might wonder, if a person is just their key pair, what's to stop you from generating someone else's keys and impersonating them, or stealing all of their Bitcoin? In order to have even a 50% likelihood of anyone colliding with someone else's Bitcoin key pair, you'd need 2 to the 128 keys registered before you're even likely to see a single collision in one of those public keys. To get a sense of scale of how large 2 to the 128th is, that's one key for every carbon atom in every human being that has ever existed. This is precisely what makes public key cryptography feasible as a form of identity. As long as you're generating keys correctly, the key space is so large that every single identity anyone generates is pretty much guaranteed to be unique. Cypherpunks were entranced by this idea. With public keys as identities, you could be identified not by your name or your email address, but by your public key. This, they believed, would make surveillance and censorship a thing of the past. It would also be impossible to create forgeries or frame someone, because if someone shared a message that was signed by your private key, there could be no doubt that it was authentic. These cryptographic data structures allow us to create a blockchain that is easily auditable and tamper-evident. But we need more than just tamper-evidence. We also want it to be extremely difficult to rewrite history. This is where proof-of-work and the distribution of data in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion come in. 
Proof of work, once again, uses hashes and the knowledge that finding a hash with specific properties, such as a certain number of leading zeros, can only be done by brute force and guessing many different possible inputs. By requiring a certain number of leading zeros for a block's hash, we achieve provable expenditure of computational and energy resources. Now we take all of these data structures used to build a blockchain and we put them onto a peer-to-peer -peer network in which nodes gossip with each other about any new valid data they receive. When a node creates a new block or transaction, it asks all of its peers if they know about the hash of that block or transaction. If the peers don't, they request the data and then validate it independently. Upon successful validation, they repeat that process and ask all of their peers if they know about the data with that hash. This results in a globally flooding message system that is highly inefficient, but the trade-off is that it is highly robust. Nick Zabo stated it well by saying, When we can secure the most important aspects of a financial network by computer science rather than by accountants, regulators, investigators, police, and lawyers, we go from a system that is manual, local, and of inconsistent security to one that is automated, global, and much more secure. Thank you.